the reason we are often asked is that why RBI is different from other central banks? Why is it that Fed will cut and RBI will not cut? The big difference is that most of the other central banks are working on this rather vexed concept of real policy rate. You will see that most central bankers are saying that real policy rates are too high compared to what those economies are used to. In the Indian context, with our current expectation of about 4.5% average inflation for FY25, our real policy rate is around 200 basis points, which by Indian standards is just fine. It's not too high. So there is no urgency on RBI's part to cut rates based on real rates. Whereas if you look at US, in US a year real rates are probably 300 basis points now given where their rates are. And by their standards, 300 basis point is a very high real rate. So that's why it's possible that RBI will not match the Fed one for one in their rate cutting and Indian rate cutting cycle might be a very shallow one with about only a 50 basis point rate cut. And I, my personal belief is that the impact of rates on India's growth is uh, overhyped. Uh, India's growth is much more structural in nature and does not require this small cyclical support from the central bank policies. I'll go to my last point, which is about uh, what I was saying the difference between uh, how the equity markets are doing versus how the currency markets are doing. Uh, my sense is that India's external sector today is probably the best health that we have ever seen. Why I, do I say so? Because if you look at current account, you'll be surprised that for the January-March quarter this just went by, current account in India should be in a surplus of about 1% of GDP. We are used to 2% of GDP deficit in current account. Now we are running our current account surplus. In fact, our projection is that for the foreseeable future, India's current account should be uh, less than 1% of GDP. I should touch wood somewhere that oil prices don't go up to $100, then all these forecasts will go for a toss. But if oil prices stay somewhat benign, we are now entering a period of much better current account than we have ever seen. And that's because our service exports are really going up. In fact, we will not be surprised if very soon our service exports will match our merchandise exports. In fact, you'll be surprised that our IT exports are now reaching the level of Saudi Arabia's oil exports. That's how large our export side has becoming. So current account is turning out to be very good. On top of it, we might be flooded with capital flows next year. One, because of this bond index inclusion, which in our view could easily bring in 30, 35 billion dollars of inflows, much more than what the mathematical way of looking at it. Uh, the debate is more on FDI. As some of you will be aware that the FDI numbers have been coming off for the last couple of years. I would argue that the decline in FDI, partly it's global in nature, but partly it's also because there has been more outflow of capital from India. The gross inflow number has not been impacted as much. In fact, we have our ways of web scraping data to figure out the FDI intent into India. And I would say that from 2023 onwards, the intent of FDI into India for the first time has crossed the intent of even FDI into Vietnam, which was the case earlier. So I'm somewhat more comfortable to project that the FDI numbers going forward would improve. On top of it, this current account improvement and the portfolio flows should give you a massive BOP surplus of 60, 70 billion dollars next year. But the but is that there is no correlation between balance of payment surplus and currency in India. 
in last 10 years, there has been only one year of currency appreciation while all the years have been BOP surplus. So this is the meat in the market that if you have a BOP surplus, the currency should appreciate. It doesn't work like that. Currency depends on two things. One is inflation differential. Our inflation differential with the rest of the world, if it increases, then the currency needs to depreciate to match that. This has been the case in the past. We have an inflation differential with the rest of the world, and that's why the currency typically depreciates. And the second thing is about RBI's view on what the true valuation of the currency should be and how much intervention RBI is doing. RBI has off late demonstrated that they want an extremely stable currency. We might ascribe motives on this. We might say that this is a precondition for rupee being internationalized, being used as a denomination currency in trade, maybe. Or it could be because of keeping our global borrowing costs low by having a very stable currency. But whatever it is, this seems to be a big driver of why the the currency has been kept where it is. So while we might argue that, look, uh, the, the, the rupee has reached an all-time low today, what gets missed is that if you look at 2024, rupee is actually the best performing EM Asian currency. So sometimes just looking at the USD INR rate, we might get a very different impression of where things are versus the actual reality out here. So let me quickly summarize some of our house views just because I was asked to put the numbers there. So we think GDP growth of close to 7%, maybe a tad lower. Uh, we think inflation in India next year should be about 4.5%. Uh, the first rate cut may be in October, but when we get the signal of that rate cut, 10-year bond yields should start coming off. So we are projecting a 10-year bond yield of about 6.5% by end of the fiscal year. Uh, currency, a very narrow range of about 2%, between 82.5 to 84. And uh, overall, I would say that I would end by saying that India should is in the right position right now to start expecting on preparing for a 8 to 10% GDP growth rather than a 6 to 8% GDP growth, which has been the story of the last decade. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you.